Thank you for joining me today. This is Mark Frasco. I'm the president and founder of COACT Associates. COACT was formed in 2003. We're a full service business growth agency. We design and we manage integrated business growth campaigns for our clients, both inside sales and marketing. Uh, thank you for joining this business builder series. Today, we're going to talk about the seven rules of demand generation. Um, should be about 30 to 35 minutes. There is a chat feature available to you, and I will pick that up and try to answer your questions along the way if you have any. If not, uh, there will be some contact information at the end of the show, and feel free to um, send me a personal email or give me a call, and we'll be glad to chat with you about um, any particular topic that you want to talk about. So we were formed in 2003, and I've been involved in uh, business growth efforts professional service firms, manufacturing firms for over 30 years. And, um, you know, I find that uh, one of the biggest challenges that organizations have is this whole, I'll say, the, the, the demand side of the business. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit today and what we've learned over this time. So if you look at what I really believe selling success is is due to far more than technique. Um, you know, when I was growing up in the in the business uh, development arena, there was a lot of technique that was being taught: uh, closed-end questions, open-end questions, um, hard closes, soft closes, and so forth. And um, I really didn't find it to be that useful. Um, and so I started to study salespeople and successful organizations as far as business growth goes. And and um, uh, what I've learned over the years is that selling success has a lot more to do with process than it does technique. It's the design and implementation of a process that proactively, rhythmically communicates your value propositions to strategic targets while building trusting relationships that enable you to learn about buying systems and a prospect's motivation to buy. I break that down intentionally. Um, it's sort of hard to look at in one fell swoop, but we're going to dance on this statement um, for the next 30 minutes or so. Again, um, I believe that uh, business growth is really about designing and implementing a process that, again, uh, predictably, rhythmically communicates what it is that your organization is uniquely qualified to do, what is your differentiating or dramatic difference in the market, if you will, your selling propositions, to a set of strategic targets. Um, not a real big fan of uh, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 email blasts. Um, I really don't think they're that effective. Um, it's really difficult to build trusting relationships, make friends with that many targets. So um, I really encourage people to think about 300, 500, 750 targets that you want to do business with that can break into your top 20% clients, and let's just bring them in and go make friends with them. So. Uh, again, rhythmically communicating their value propositions to these strategic targets over time, and we'll talk about this today, that interaction creates trusting relationships. Uh, people don't build trust um, until you have some interaction. You can't just send them a Christmas card and expect that uh, they're going to really care about your brand or care about you. That interaction and that trusting relationship over time enables us to learn about buying systems. And, and I, I use these words intentionally. I, I sometimes will teach our people that if you feel like you're selling, stop, because selling gets in the way of learning. Um, so really trying to learn about these buying systems, the people in those systems, what their, what their joys and pains are in those systems, what they're looking for um, from where they're at today to where they see the future with a particular product or service that you sell. And then, of course, getting underneath what a prospect's motivation to buy is. Um, we used to talk about pain. I don't know if it's much about pain as it just is an idea of a better future than where they are today. So let's, let's talk just a little bit about the business growth challenge. Um, Harvard Business Review wrote this. It's been 15 years ago or so, but I picked it out, and, it, and I still think it's probably true. They researched in the B2B market, businesses lose between 15 and 25% of last year's business each year. So, you know, here we are sort of at the beginning of the year. We're in the first quarter and we've come through strategic uh, planning sessions and we've set our goals for 2016. 
you know, we have to, many of us have to not only make up this 15 to 25%, but we want to grow 5, 10, 15% this next year. And so, you know, when you add those two up, you begin to understand and see the, the gap, the, the uh, uh, real seriousness of having to raise that top line when you've lost 15 to 25% of last year's business. So um, building demand and strategic demand is really important. Lack, uh, most organizations lack a clear strategic focus and or dedicated resources at specific, you know, processes, process steps in the sales continuum. Um, you know, in your organizations, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, you have a CFO and a bookkeeper, you have a warehouse manager maybe and a shipping clerk. But in sales, we often lack dedicated resource on the demand side. Uh, we do pretty well on proposal um, negotiate, do the work, nurture business in those areas. But pre-proposal in the demand stages, we don't do quite as well. So it's a pretty big challenge. Um, as a supplier, you are often evaluated and selected by your future customers rather than the other way around. I alluded to this earlier, at least in COAC, what we try to do is work with our clients, again, to um, determine who their high value targets are, research those targets, and then go make friends with them and bring them in, actually select our future customers. Um, really important nuance, I believe, rather than waiting for somebody to hit your site, wait, waiting for somebody to walk by a trade show booth um, or call you, um, let's, let's again, let's uh, strategically select them, research them, uh, get them into our systems and build, and build processes of interaction that create trusting relationships with them and eventually open them up and have them buy. But related to that, um, I think what we're going to talk about today, I think one of the, the biggest um, uh, hurdles in most organizational growth has to do with the variable of timing. And I call it Christmas card marketing. Christmas card marketing doesn't work. Um, assuming that you know what you're doing and you know how to compete and price and serve in your market, um, Timing is really the biggest variable then for us to stay top of mind so that when somebody does have some need or has an interest in what it is that you might be selling, um, they think of you, you're top of mind. So let's, um, let's, let's take a little dive into, um, in, into the, the whole art of demand generation. So if you're looking at this, you know, I, uh, if I were in front of you in, in person, I might have you laser vote or something on this, but think about from the point of awareness to winning an order, what is the gestation of your cell? You know, is it usually you make a phone call or send, send an email, you meet somebody and within a month you're getting an order or is it more like six or 12 months or more than 12 months? Um, pretty important to know this. Um, it's pretty important to understand the cycles, the, that gestation of sale. You know, I came from the construction industry. I spent 12 years selling uh, consulting engineering services and general contracting, and the gestation of a sale there can be as long as two or three years. Um, from the time you make your original contact, you build awareness to where you actually uh, get an inked order. Um, and then there's others of you on the line, again, maybe where you make a phone call, maybe the item that you're selling or the service that you're selling is something that's budgeted week to week, month to month, maybe purchased on a regular frequency. Maybe you make the call, time you build awareness, you build some trust, and within a month you can get an order. It's important to understand this nuance, so just be thinking about that as we move through the presentation today. In your typical sale, how many buying influences are involved? This is another variable. I know when I first started selling, um, it was, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, and um, you could oftentimes have a relationship with one person in an organization and, and, and you, could, you could gather a good amount of business with that relationship. Um, less so today, uh, buying systems are becoming much more complex in the sense that there's more people involved, um, sometimes committees, sometimes there's a number of people that are at different levels in the organization that have different power and support for your solution. Um, so I think it's really important also to understand, are, are you selling the type of product or service that is typically one person, one-on-one -on -one relationship and you can get the business, or is it a more complex sell? 
and I have, when you sell construction or when you sell some of these really complex long gestation uh, products, um, or if you're sell sometimes if you're selling software, those sort of things that cross over uh, departmental lines, you may have 8, 10, 12 buying influences in that cell. Let's think about, I alluded to it a second ago, let's, let's think about the sales continuum and um, how that works and where demand generation really comes into play. If you take the sales continuum from 0 to 10 and 10 is making money, around a 7 is where we would issue a proposal, uh, make an offer. 8, get the work. 9, do the work. 10, make money. I'd like you to think of this side is the supply side of your business. So from proposal to close to produce or serve and then make money, that's the supply side of your business. On the supply side of your business, as I alluded to earlier, you have dedicated people. They're trained and educated for the jobs that they do. There's usually an organizational chart. There's job descriptions, lines of authority. Um, you have processes in place on the supply side that are typically well refined. You have process flows, process descriptions, you have standard operating procedures, standard forms on the supply side, and then you have a performance management system that's wrapped around this, uh, maybe key performance indicators. You keep track of progress and attainment of various goals or um, results that you're looking for. You might have dashboards. Um, so the point is the supply side of our business is highly refined. There's a lot of specificity typically in most organizations, especially those that are most successful. But on the demand side, uh, what we found is, and, and what we're going to talk about today, is that we often don't have these sort of systems in place that we have on the supply side. We don't have dedicated people in place. We don't have processes well-defined on the demand side pre-proposal, and we often don't have a performance management system pre-proposal. So what I'd like you to think about as we're going through this today is these subsystems inside the sales continuum pre-proposal on the demand side. Um, we've spent a lot of time, I've spent a lot of time researching these and defining these. Um, strategy, we're going to talk about it today. What is the most decisive growth strategy to grow your organization? Strategy should inform you as much about what you're not going to do, who you're not going to pursue, as who you are going to pursue. Um, once you have a clear strategy in mind, um, what are the products, what are the value propositions, what are the markets you're going to, uh, that, that, you're, that you're going to introduce yourself into, research. You've got to get online nowadays. It's, it's getting a little bit easier. If you have the right subscriptions or if you know the right friends, you can do some uh, market research based on the strategy description that you have. Third, design. Um, designing branding systems, designing messaging systems in the market um, that are going to help stay top of mind but get the attention and hook, hook your brand into the minds of buying systems that you, again, are strategically approaching. And then four, five, six. Remember, dedicated people, processes, and a performance system in place to prospect, pre-qualify, and position new business opportunities. So when we think of the sales continuum, try to break it down in your minds and think about your business. How do you do from 7 to 10? Proposal, close, provide, and make money. My guess is you're really good at what you do. Um, likewise, ask yourself, how are you doing on the demand side? Do you have a clear, decisive strategy? Do you have a researched list of people that you want to do business with in the future? Have you designed with clarity your brand in the marketplace, your messaging to the market? And do you have dedicated people and processes in place that are going to prospect, pre-qualify, and position, create interaction in the market. Let's break into the first rule of demand gen, and we just alluded to it, strategic focus. This is one model. I like this model. I'm a really big fan of fast strategy. I think there's a time, I guess, in many organizations to spend you know weeks and months thinking about strategy, but I, I really think that um, strategy itself 
um, in, a, in, in what markets that you're trying to approach. Get the right people in the room in your organization. Maybe it's a business coach, maybe even a few customers, and talk with them about where they see the market going and what's going on in that market. What's the market attractiveness? Is it low? Is it moderate? Or is it high on this y-axis? And then when you think about what it is that your organization does, what does it do that is unique? What does it do that, that creates a dramatic difference in the marketplace? Everybody is going to say, you know, they're competitive, that they have good service, um, that they're priced, you know, in a certain way. But what really is the dramatic difference that you make in the market? Do you have a weak or strong competitive advantage in the marketplace? And then begin to think about those markets and your competitive advantage in those markets. And then what is your activity or what are the actions that you're going to take? Obviously, if um, you know, market attractiveness is low and your competitive advantage is weak, you would divest or reassign resources in a different area. Don't go there. If there was a really, really attractive market, your competitive advantage is weak, invest strategically, develop an advantage over time. Um, if that's a good market and um, you feel like it, you should eventually be able to compete in that market, you need to invest strategically to do that. On the other hand, if it's a market that's not that attractive, low, but your differentiation is very strong, monitor investment, protect, you know, go into protect mode and monitor your investment. And of course, where we'd love to play are in those very attractive markets where we feel like we have or are developing a very strong differentiating factor. Invest, pursue those markets. So again, I would propose a structure something like this, looking at the attractiveness of those markets, looking at what you've done in the past, and, and making the right decisions. And you could have three or four different strategies depending on the product or service that you're you're working on or that you supply. The second rule, build your ideal customer profile. Alluded to this earlier. Who are your high value targets? A tool that I've used in the past, um, it's from Miller Hyman Strategic Selling, and that is to make a list of three, four, five of your best customers, put them in that left column. Maybe uh, three, four, five of your not best customers on the right side, and then come inside towards the center. What are the traits or characteristics of your best customers? What are the traits or characteristics of those that are not the best? And then now start to fill that ideal client profile in using those characteristics or traits. Again, assuming that where you're working today with the best is good, and assuming that those that are not that great are not where you want to be, this chart should help you hone in on your ideal client profile. And that's going to help you as you begin to do your research and identify more like those. So I hope this tool will be useful to you. Brand engagement, brand design, brand awareness. Um, I know at COACT, um, we, are, we are, I am, anybody who works at COACT will tell you this, I am very, very particular about the way our brand gets used, the way it's referenced. Um, you know, with the age of electronics today, it's cool because we can get our brands out more, more uh, fluidly. But at the same time, I think uh, we have to be very careful to not damage who we are in the market. Um, never stretch your logos. Never, you know, uh, let some computer do something to your logo that represents your look and style and feel any different than the way exactly that you want it. Um, for us... Uh, we actually go through this. Our URL is lowercase team, hiercase coact.com, not all lowercase team coact. Our signatures are a certain way with our names bold. You do the same thing in your organization. Identify those brand elements and the impressions that you want to create in the market. How memorable do you want to be? And clean these things up. This next sheet might help you a little bit. I use this when I work with clients sometimes. And that's just a checklist for them to go through in sort of auditing uh, their brand materials, their logo, their tagline, their business cards. I've worked with organizations where I would go in to meet with them, and I'd meet with four people, and there would be four different business cards or two or three different business cards, different logos, the colors don't match, the layout is different. It's very confusing to the market. 
we want to make sure that we have a consistent, predictable look in the market so that when somebody gets something from you electronically or in the mail, whatever it might be, it's an aha moment for them. They say, oh, that's Coact. I know these guys. I've seen that logo. I've seen that teamcoact.com. So your brochures, newsletters, postcards, email signatures, website, make sure your website matches your business cards. Make sure your brochures match your website look and a color palette that you've chosen. Um, you know, at Coact, um, our senior designer has spent a lot of time in making sure that we use the right colors, we have the right font, um, that we know when we use bold, when we don't use bold, and that goes through every one of the items on this list. So develop a list and audit your brand. What does it look like? Brand awareness is useful, but it's no longer sufficient. Now we really need to build content, and content must cause the prospect to engage. So, you know, we talk about demand generation, and we talk about these systems where people are making phone calls and we're sending emails and those sort of things. Again, useful, builds awareness, but it's not sufficient. Our systems today need to be creating content, video, white papers, project profiles, educational content, Part of what COAC does, seven rules of demand generation, is exactly this. We're trying to build more and more engaging content where people can learn something from what we've learned over the years. Um, you need to be doing the same thing. I think it's, again, interesting that you, you offer this product or service and that you have these value propositions, but teach your market about what it is that you do. Make them better at what they do. Um, and then if they feel like you can help them, believe me, they will engage with you. Every marketing department is now like a newspaper editorial desk. You know, some of you who maybe are in your late 30s, 40s, and older, um, you know, this almost seems like unimaginable to you. But our, each organization in the world now has the power of pen, um, where we used to have to advertise in newspapers and those sort of things, or radio or TV, Nowadays, every organization through the electronics has the power of an editorial desk. You can write your own stories. You can write your own editorial. You can write your own newsletters. And hopefully there's teaching in all of that that helps the market become better every day, and you're a part of making that market better. So every marketing department, in fact, every organization today um, is now like a newspaper editorial desk. Don't squander it. Um, it's really important that you teach the market. Always include a valuable call to action, some opt-in option in your materials, whether it is signing up for a webinar or getting a book or seeing us at the trade show, um, whatever it might be, try to always have something to opt in so that somebody could say, yes, I want more. Different platforms for different audience. Um, all built on the brand standard. Some audiences, you know, it might be technical papers. In other audiences, it might be more playful people stories. Whatever it might be, you've got to know your industry, you've got to know your buyers, um, and you have to follow that lead. So different platforms for different audiences. Also, when I think about platforms, I think about the different kinds of media that we use to build brand awareness in the marketplace. I'm a really, really big fan of mixed media campaigns. Um, I can remember back in the day, I don't want to bore you too much, but I remember when the fax machine first came out, and we had, we had catalogs that we would print with, with valves and filters and things in that catalog. And we thought, you know, we'll just give people our fax number, and they'll just fax us orders, and we're done. We don't even need salespeople anymore. Well, of course, you know, that faded away. But today, the point is, today I think we are – overly reliant on email marketing. Um, I call it homogenous marketing. It's easy. Uh, it's cheap. Uh, we can do it pretty quickly. And so we, you know, wrestle up a thousand names or 5,000 names and we send out an email every week. Um, I really don't think that works. Um, I really don't think, I really don't think telesales works, you know, by itself. Uh, certainly direct mail doesn't work by itself. But I think the mix of those with a personal touch, phone call, handwritten note, those are different platforms. Every, every buying influence 
in your system likes to receive information in a different way based on their personality style, based on their generational preferences, based on their communication preferences. So different platforms for different audiences. Don't think that your email campaign is the best fit for everybody. So send a postcard in a couple weeks, send an email, make a phone call, do a handwritten note, mix it up, do a white paper, maybe do a video, send it out, send a book, send a brand logo piece with a magnet, whatever it is, mix it up. So let's talk a little bit about the fourth rule, and that is making waves. If you were to think about your current demand system pre-proposal, uh, you look at your direct mail, the phone calls you make, email, maybe even the hand, you know, the face-to-face -face, um, contacts that you make. On average, with people who are not sending you money, people who are not your customers, are you doing less than four touches per year, eight to twelve, more than thirteen? Uh, think about that, and then of those, how many of those are what I would consider to be personal, which is a phone call with a human to human. Um, or face-to-face -face meeting. How many of those per year? Um, I think it's important for us to understand that as, as we um, are building our demand systems. Um, what we find is in the B2B market that typically 10 to 12 interactions um, per year per target is a good B2B frequency. Um, it's really important that you stay top of mind. Remember the whole conversation about timing that you stay top of mind so that so that you eliminate that variable of timing again. Um, so think about how many touches you're getting, and then I would say build these uh, wave plans, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So I always tell people this is the master's level stuff, the happy face and the sad face, but imagine a happy buyer, a buying influence that's pleased with their current situation. Their motivation to buy is low. On the other hand, the sad face, a buying influence who's not happy with his current situation or her current situation, motivation to buy is high. So if you take, you know, a timeline over a year or if these are quarters and it's three or four years, depending on the gestation of your sale, and you were to use these stars as the touches when you make a touch, maybe you make three touches a year with those people that are not sending you money. You send out the happy holidays card, something in February or March. Summer goes by, you know, something in the fall. And then imagine this one line is the mood line, the feeling line of that one buying influence. Well, when you made those interactions where the stars are, on this particular buying influence, you had very little memorability, very little impact, because their motivation to buy was low. And with your three touches, you really haven't done much to help yourself. Now, if you can imagine... 500 of these lines or a thousand of these lines squiggling across this timeline uh, you can imagine the challenge you'd have if you only did three or four touches a year you're only going to hit a certain percentage of them when they start to dip in their satisfaction of course if we knew when buying systems and buying influences were beginning to dip in their satisfaction somebody messed up on service quality price whatever it might be um, if we knew when that was going to happen, we would just call them then, but we don't. There's no system yet to tell us when people are ready to buy. So you know this next slide. What, what we have to do in our demand systems is we need to build, like I said earlier, 10 to 12 interactions per year per target um, to make sure that we eliminate that variable of timing. This next slide, you know, at Coact, we like to talk about the waves that we create in the market. So we call these making waves. So the introduction wave, and this is just a suggested design for you. This is just a template. But you should um, go away after this session, I'm hoping, and you should design what is your wave plan over the next 6 or 12 months. Um, so make an introduction phone call. Maybe you verify Contact information, spelling, titles, phone numbers, email addresses, those sort of things. Send an introduction letter on your letterhead. Make it formal. Have it come from a principal in your organization. Let the, let the receiver know that this is not a random letter. This is a strategic, intentional letter. We've done our research, and you fit our ideal customer profile. We would love to show you what we've done for customers just like you in the marketplace. 
Hope you don't mind. We're going to stay in touch. So make this letter on your letterhead and have a principal sign it and inform the addressee that um, you, you are interested and will be pursuing them um, to discuss what it is that you dramatically do different in the market that the competitors do. Phone follow-up, go into the next wave, maybe you mail a postcard. I like postcards because they're like direct mail billboards. Um, after the introduction letter, I typically don't like to send anything in an envelope because people learn how to resist certain predictable patterns. And if they're not interested and you keep sending stuff in an envelope, uh, by the second or third one, they won't even open the envelope. They just throw it right in the trash. So I like postcards. It gets your, it gets your logo in front of people. It also usually, if done and designed well, it's got some provocative, you know, curiosity, credibility type statement on it. Um, then you make a phone call, talk about a value proposition, a unique value proposition of your organization in the marketplace. I usually suggest by the third, fourth, fifth um, interaction, somewhere in there, um, think about doing a handwritten note. Um, we like handwritten notes with the logo of our clients on it. Um, and go in there and, I mean, actually, actually get a pen and actually put it on paper and write something. Um, it's not done that often anymore, and, and people open them. Um, and if you've had four or five touches with them before that, there begins to be an emotional attachment to your brand and maybe to you because they've heard your voice on voicemail, they've deleted it, they've seen your stuff, and now they've seen your handwriting. And you've said to them, Joe, I'm sorry, I have been trying to reach you. I'm sorry we haven't been able to connect. I would love to show you the value of COACT and what we think we can do to help you grow our business, grow your business. And they will begin to soften up. That interaction begins to build social capital or trust. And then they begin to click into your materials maybe, maybe even make a return phone call, whatever it might be. But keep moving through these waves. Mix the media. Homogenous marketing does not work. So make the phone call, send the card, send an email, and every three, four, five weeks, um, make sure that you're having some interaction with that high-value target. Fifth, the fifth rule of demand generation, and one that is often um, forgotten, keep score. Keep score of how many phone calls are made. Keep score of how many of those are completed calls with decision makers. The fact that you've talked to a receptionist is interesting, but not that useful. I want to keep track of the actual decision makers that you've spoken to today, this week, this month, this quarter. I want to know how many calls were made, how many completed calls. I want to know what that percentage of completed calls is. I want to know, in the sense of conversions, how many meetings were set up in the demand generation system, how many proposals were issued, what was the value of those proposals, how many did you close? What was the value of the close? So keep score. And I would say, you know, if your culture allows it, I know at COACT we do, if your culture allows it, make it make it public. Put it in a on a bulletin board somewhere where everybody goes and show people what's going on in your system. Keep score. If you don't know where you're at and you don't you you, you have no idea of uh, how successful you've been, you really don't know what to do and what to do next. I'm a really big believer in transparency and living in a fact-based environment where we can make decisions based on what we're seeing in the system. It's usually not about the people. I'll remind you, it's usually when you're trying to make improvements in your systems, it has a lot more to do with process than it does people. So we can spend all day long training people on open-end and closed-end questions, and we can teach them all day long on trial closes and hard closes, but you can put the best salesperson in a bad system and it's going to be very difficult for them to be successful, which leads right into rule number six, process trumps technique. So, you know, I just put this up. This is a, a sales funnel. Um, I, Whenever I work with a client, if they don't have one, I like to help them create a sales funnel. Um, Unknown, lead attention, lead interest, lead discovery, opportunity or meeting, opportunity demo. These are stages of the sales process. Um, for, I like to do it usually from the buying influence's perspective. So the buying influence, we have their attention, we have their interest, they're beginning to go through discovery, um, etc. And I like to make sure that, that 
my processes are designed where I know how do you get to the next stage? What, how do you define that you're into the next stage? So if you look at lead interest, I've defined getting into that as a prospect has engaged with sales and or marketing prospecting efforts is expressing some interest. That's how you get into stage two. And then the next step, I want genuine interest, you know, and, and, and so on. So each one of these, you try to define how do you get in it and how do you get out of it? And then back to keeping score, where, how many prospects, how many ideal customers do you have in each stage? And a funnel is a funnel on purpose because, you know, it's if you start with 100, it's hard to get 100 to stage four. In fact, when you start with 100, I can almost tell you from all the experience over 30 years, you're lucky if 20 of the 100 get to stage four. That's really, really big. If you can meet with 20 out of 100 that you approach. What I'm, what I'm saying is, that's, this, is what, this is why demand generation is so important. This is why building relationships pre-proposal is so important. Because 80% of the people that you target strategically, that you've researched, that you know have a propensity to buy what it is you sell, 80% of them will never buy from you. And that's hard to understand. But they will never buy from you for various reasons. 20% will. Let's make sure we know how those 20% are matriculating through the system and where they're at. I like to give people percentages of the stages. Um, every four months in COAC, we do a complete report out of the stages of the prospects in the sales funnel. And then I've depicted, you know, marketing waves across. I, you know, whether you've, whether you've onboarded somebody and they, you've proposed and closed and won, or you're prospecting, trying to get their attention and interest, you might have a different marketing platform. You might have a little bit different messaging, but I keep I keep marketing going to to my current clients. I want them to know that I'm I'm continually in the market, that I'm learning, and that I'm trying to share and I'm trying to teach. I my clients are on my mail list and on my email list and and on my webinar list, and I'm hoping that they're watching our videos and that they're engaging with the customer advocacy on our website and that they're reading my newsletters. I want, them to know, I want them to know that there's nobody that they know that's more serious about business growth than me and than us, and you're the same way. So make sure that your market knows that there's nobody, no competitor, no individual in the market that's more serious about what it is that you do than you, uh, and you're trying to teach them that. Lastly, um, unyielding dedication. Um, I'll tell you what. Many, this quote is just perfect for anybody who's a professional business growth person. And if you've been around and done this for a living, any part of your life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. And this is really a big statement. You should print this out and you should post it on your office wall or on your cube. Because when you quit, or you don't do something that you're supposed to do, make that touch this month, this three-week period, this four-week period, you don't realize maybe how close you were to success when you stopped. Um, you could be one call away. You could be, two, you could be two interactions away from a very large order or an important client that's going to be a client of yours for the rest of your life. There is nothing negative. There is nothing ineffective about having regular quality interaction with strategic target to have a propensity to buy what it is that you sell. There is no, no negative outcome from that, and there's no reason that you would ever decide to discontinue that, in my mind. Um, I would say, some people might say, well, I've got more business than I can handle, then I would say, you've got a supply side problem. I never stop trying to grow my business. I never stop trying to make new relationships and friendships for the future. So. When is the best time to start? Today. Um, when is the best time to stop? Never. I would never stop trying to develop meaningful relationships that have some benefit to me in the future. So in summarizing, make sure you have a strategic focus, that you understand where it is that you're going and why you're going there. Make sure that 
Your strategy also helps inform you that what you're not going to chase. There's so much in our systems that we chase that we shouldn't, and it's because we don't have a real good strategic focus. Um, build your ideal customer profile. If your current customer base is a good indicator of who it is you want to do business with in the future, then look at the characteristics or traits of your current customer profile and start to build uh, research around um, your future customers. Brand engagement, brand awareness, brand consistency. One, make sure all your materials, your website, your business cards, your signatures, everything looks like who you are. Everything is the right font, the right color, the right size, the right shape. And then when you're building awareness, you become more memorable. I mean, could you imagine if, if, you know, I don't know, IBM or Microsoft um, had all these various logos and colors and things like that? I, I guess if you intentionally did it, you might be able to pull that off if you spent a billion dollars. But, but, you know, Google does it, I guess, a little bit. But, you know, it's a little bit different. But I think in most B2B sales, if not almost all, this brand consistency and uh, helps build that, you know, that top of mind that you're looking for when people see it. They get in it. They get an emotional feeling about it. Make waves. Every three, four, or five weeks, make sure that you're having an interaction with every strategic target on your list. Use your CRM. Make sure you're mixing the media. Uh, just don't do email campaigns. Make phone calls. Send handwritten notes. Do a postcard. Send a white paper. Send a project profile. Maybe there's a video of a customer saying pretty words about what it is you do. Make waves, regular quality interaction. Keep score. Make sure that you're keeping score, that you know where you're at. Live in a fact-based environment. How many conversions are you getting out of how many phone calls, out of how many completed calls, etc.? Remember, process trumps technique. Stop spending so much time teaching your salespeople technique. Um, in fact, many times I just like to tell my salespeople, be you. Don't worry about technique. Be the best you you can be. Have a personality. Be in the moment. Share your intelligence. But work inside a process that you understand the stages of what you're trying to accomplish. How do you get to the next stage? Make sure that you have that designed and your people understand the stages that you're trying to get through. And then again, unyielding dedication. Never stop. Never give up. you got to continue to work the funnel every day. For the rest of your lives. I'm sorry, but that's what we're uh, we're destined for. <laughs> Hope this was useful for you. Um, we will um, continue our series in May, and uh, this should be a fun one. We're going to talk about people are strange, even buyers and sellers, and this will be a conversation about um, personality styles, buyer preferences and seller preferences, how people receive information, get information, and use information to make buying and selling decisions. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was useful to you and your business. Um, again, if there are any questions or if there's any conversation that you would like to have, feel free to contact me at COACT. Would love the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you very much. Have a good day.